This is Kandahar Air Base, the gateway to the war in Afghanistan. We live in a war zone here. The moment you step outside a while, you are in the threat zone. There's one billion pounds of NATO hardware and 10,000 soldiers from around the world all inside the wire. But it's also a bustling community in the middle of the desert. I'd even recommend it to my own mother. Complete with fast food joints, sports pitches, and even a couple of massage parlors. <laughs> this is a war zone like you've never seen. And it's the story of everyday life of the British men and women living here. Some nice men in there. <laughs> Can't help but look. The ones in the sky and those on the ground. It's nice here, but obviously when we go out on the ground, it's totally different. Afghanistan, one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Almost a thousand soldiers have died here since 2001. But inside Kandahar Airfield, it's a different world. And the man making sure everything runs like clockwork here is RAF Air Commodore Bob Judson. I am the mayor of the, of the town, if you like. I'm running the base as the base commander, and I'm the landlord for the real estate here. The camp is 10 square miles, and it's got everything you'd expect of a town this size. The two-mile airstrip runs along the top. Right in the middle is the boardwalk, where you'll find home comforts like Pizza Hut, Subway, and Burger King. There's a church, a laundry that gets through 12 tonnes of washing a day, two supermarkets, three gyms and three huge canteens feeding 14,000 people. The difficulty here is that the food, the water, the sewage, you can't take for granted. All of the electricity is off generators uh, that are fuel powered. And we use over half a million liters of fuel here a day servicing the airfield as a whole. The base is in southern Afghanistan, 100 miles from the capital Kabul and 12 miles south of Kandahar city. It's close to the combat zone in Helmand province and to the Pakistan border, so it's a perfect location for NATO's air power. We've got every type of aircraft under the sun, from fast jets to doing the bombing rollout here, to unmanned air vehicles doing reconnaissance and also actually attack missions. We're running about 10,000 movements a month out of here. That, to put it in perspective, that's uh, about half of Gatwick Airport. The camp's built next door to Kandahar International Airport. Domestic Afghani planes share the runway with Chinooks and Hercules. But at the heart of the operation are the GR9 Harriers. They provide air support to the troops on the front line. Jet pilot Rich Hillard, also known as Bolly, was training earlier this year on aircraft carrier HMS Illustrious. He's now on his fifth tour of duty in Afghanistan. This place has changed in the four years I've been coming here and it did start off as quite a bare base. We were living in tents, showering in tents, but you know now, other than being a long way away from home, it's pretty good. This is where all the engineering takes place, where we come and get our jets from. This bit here is the, uh, the smoking area for the dirty tavers. Disgusting. Uh, out here the guys have got a, a bit of a wreck area. They've put a lot of effort in in their, their downtime to make a bit of decking. And it's the ideal lads pad. Inside the fighter pilots are off duty, playing war games. I'm still just looking up in the sky. Oh, I've gone indoors accidentally. Yes! Over at the girls' accommodation, 21-year-old Kate Aziz from Wales is getting ready for work. Right, this is the showers and toilets. They've got urinals in here. I don't know why, because there's no blocks. 
Actions on a rocket attack. Nice lie down when you're soaking wet and in a towel. Toilets, really, really nice. And the showers. So I'm gonna have a shower. So I'll uh, see you later. Kate's one of 900 women on the base. She shares her room with three others. This is my den, my bed, and I bought this to cover it up, so she got a bit of privacy. But um, this is Hannah's space. <laughs> and obviously, Christian and Matthew are my two favourite men, after Ross Kemp. <laughs> Kate looks after RAF admin. She's in HR. Right, we're just going to get the mail now. Can we pick up for 904, please? And part of her job is doing the post run. That's an e-bluey that you do on the internet, and that's a handwritten bluey, so it gives people an excuse to write to you. <laughs> but nobody ever does. <laughs> but nobody ever does. Not to me. <laughs> Kate's got about seven sacks of letters and parcels a day to deliver, but her rounds take time, because the speed limit is a cautious 10 miles per hour. You can see how slow it is. You could actually cycle faster. I was in a mood the other day, so I come out, I just thought, right, I'm going to do mail. And I got up to, <laughs> I got up to like 60 <laughs> down this road, because I just put my foot down. Well, I haven't been caught yet, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sure I will at some point. And she's not joking. There are about 80 military police on the base, and they spend a lot of time doing speed checks. They're also on the lookout for relationships, because here, the no-touching rule applies. But Kate's got another confession. This is Ben, my friend. <laughs> He's done his hair specially. <laughs> did he bring his hair jelly? You were embarrassing me, eh? Don't, that'd be beautiful. <laughs> It's Afghan Independence Day, and the commander of Kandahar Airfield has had a tip-off that the Taliban are planning an attack. If you're here in a support role, but with rockets coming in over the wire on a relatively frequent basis, uh, it's a very, very harsh reality. As night falls, a familiar sound rings out. <laughs> by the sounds of it. The Taliban rocket the base once or twice a week, but after being here for six months, these soldiers act pretty cool. You hear the bangs sometimes, it just depends on where the rockets land and how loud the bang is. Obviously, I nearly jumped on my pants the first time. This time, it's just a little bit more relaxed. Just another night in paradise. <laughs> So far, no one in Kandahar has been killed by a rocket, and tonight it's landed on the far side of the camp. That is the old clear siren, which means we can now take our helmets off and chill out again. The base is a sitting target, and it's down to the British RAF regiment to guard it. The moment they're outside the fence, there is a, a threat from mines, both uh, modern mines emplaced by the insurgents and also legacy mines that have been there for years in this conflict-ravaged country. Earlier this year, two of the regiment were killed just outside the airbase when their snatch Land Rover went over a mine. The vehicle wasn't designed to withstand explosives. But a delivery has just arrived on the runway. A Russian Antonov cargo plane, the biggest plane in the world, has a shipment of 30 brand new Vixen Land Rovers that have a bit more protection. Bob Judson's come to inspect them. The top half is the Snatch. Yeah. The main difference being is the bottom half is the R Wimmick. It's uh, hit my ride, really. It's an alloy as opposed to the wheels on the Snatch. That makes these, these uh, a lot lighter. But hopefully it will be an improvement, that's for sure. I mean, I think the, the blast protection bit is obviously key. 
they take real punishment, no question. It's a uh, massive task on the vehicles. Anything's better than what we've got at the minute, so that's great. Uh, and, uh, but don't assume that it's, uh, it's the perfect solution to everything that we need. Every six months, a new squadron comes out to Kandahar to guard the base. The next batch are getting ready to leave RAF Honington in Suffolk. All right, lads, what's going to happen in a minute, right? You're going to get your final inspection from the corporals, all right? You should bring out your passport, your native travel order, and show your ID card as well. Send right, send right. Good. Before they go, Sergeant Bennett Jones is making sure his lads have got everything they need. Lads, get your dog tags out now so I can see them. ID card. Because they're heading into a war zone, they've been given their dog tags to wear for the very first time. I didn't want any problems over the weekend that I need to sort out now before we fuck off. What? The what? Right, don't worry about that. <laughs> Fuck it now. <laughs> Fucking idiot. <laughs> right, take over. I'm pretty much their dad, and I think any dad would agree with me, uh, having a child is very stressful, <laughs> all right? Um, now imagine having 30 kids to look after at once, so you can imagine what I'm going to be like sometimes. Out of 30 men, he's got 18 brand new recruits, and one of them is 21-year-old Nathan Chules. I've never felt like this before, so I mean, it's a really weird feeling. Good feeling, though, so I mean, heart's going. Really looking forward to it. It's time to say goodbye. And for Jonesy, it means leaving his pregnant fiance, Lucy. It's just a bit nerve-wracking now because I'm not going to see him until he gets back after the baby's born, so scary, I suppose. <laughs> There have been more than 100 British deaths in Afghanistan. So no one can be sure if they'll see their loved ones again. We'll be back before you know it, right? I have a lovely little daughter. <laughs> right, you're going to be crying in a minute. Yeah? All right? I love you. I love you. All right, come on. Get out of here now, right? So you don't see us go. <laughs> go. No, I'm going to wait with those. Go on. All right? I'll speak to you soon. I didn't expect, I don't know, to be so emotional. It's just when he said, I love you, and I just thought, oh, God, here we go, you know. It's one of the most difficult things I've, I've experienced. I thought I could bear it, but to be honest, I fucking, I, well, I broke, in all honesty. I think any person that's in love with somebody like that and is expecting their child would do. It's his job, and I've just really got to cope with it because otherwise I'll get nowhere. <laughs> but I think for the next couple of days I'll just be crying in a hole. Four thousand miles away in Kandahar, the airbase is getting ready for a top secret NATO operation. A convoy of 200 trucks are leaving the base and travelling 100 miles north through hostile territory to deliver a 200-tonne turbine to the Kajaki Dam. It's known as a hearts and minds operation and it will bring electricity to 100,000 Afghan homes. To help the convoy out, Harrier pilot Bolly is going to take some reconnaissance photos of the route so the trucks don't run into any surprises. Uh, Bottle of water in my little bag here just in case I get thirsty and I've got a, another uh, bag there in case I need the loo. Yeah. Hopefully just take a few photos and that'll be it. We don't really know what's going to happen. Um, we do a lot of planning beforehand but often it's not, that's not actually what we end up doing. The Harrier GR9 jump jet is loaded with weaponry for every mission and Bonnie's jet is carrying rockets and bombs weighing over 2,000 pounds. He's got two laser-guided paveway bombs that can wipe out whole compounds. He's also carrying 38 of the more versatile CRV-7 rockets, which travel four times faster than the speed of sound. The warheads can be released individually or all at once for a bigger impact. And if that wasn't enough, he's got two airburst bombs with a lethal radius the size of a football pitch. 
but the purpose of this mission is to take some photos. So under the fuselage is a stills camera. After taking a few photos, he gets a call from the troops on the ground. They're being attacked near Kajaki and want Bolly to find out where the rockets are coming from. Two miles out. He'll be screaming down the radio, there'll be bullets going on in the background and he'll be in a lot of trouble. And he's just trying to get across to me as quickly as possible where that threat's coming from. Bolly switches on a bit of kit that's revolutionised the way the war is fought in Afghanistan. It's called a sniper targeting pod, which is next to the steels camera under the fuselage. Its telescopic lens gives the pilots a detailed view of the ground, which is then beamed to the troops on the front line, giving the soldiers live bird's eye footage of the enemy. The difference in what you can see on that screen is massive. So before you used to only be able to see the general outline of a building and maybe you might see a blob that would be a car. Now with the sniper pod, you can tell what sort of car it is. And at 20,000 feet, the sniper pod can tell the difference between the troops and the Taliban. Two miles out, visual, okay. The army asks Bolly for a show of force. My aim is to provide the maximum noise on the ground to scare the guys away. Okay. I'm flying the jet down to 100 feet above the ground, going along at about 600 miles an hour, so I've got to look out for people potentially shooting at me. But probably the biggest thing I've got to look out for is the ground, because when you're going that fast, that low, it comes up to meet you pretty quickly. There's also lots of aerials in Afghanistan, and if you hit one of those, that would really spoil your day. So I've got to stay cool, really. At the sight of the jet, the Taliban make a run for it. And Bolly heads home to Kandahar with his bombs all intact. The idea of the game isn't to make holes in Afghanistan because we're here to try and you know, support our guys on the ground. People know that you know if they do start messing with them, um, there's an effect, something like this, on its way down to them if, uh, if it's so wished. And the Kajaki Dam mission is a triumph. Over at the accommodation blocks, Kate is enjoying some downtime. It's not like your usual Sunday that sesh when uh, you're abroad, but here we are. Got to make do with what you got. So, <laughs> I'm not going to come out yet for four months to go back pain, so that's for sure. <laughs> and in case you're wondering, that's her body armour. Well, I should really be wearing it, but it'll ruin my timelines. When are you due to leave? Ten. Right. I'll check we've got your paperwork. Part of Kate's job is booking flights. Probably put it in the burn bag. Feels like you're doing something worthwhile. You don't realise sometimes how much booking someone's flight all means to them, and it's a nice feeling. I should get priority, really. Do you think? Yes. I think you should get priority. Well, but I'll let him know that you think that you should have priority yeah. above everyone else. And yes, yeah, good job. I do enjoy it. We have a good laugh and good banter with people. Hey, well, this is easy's. Kate's six weeks into her four-month tour of duty, but the lads still like to give her a hard time. SAC, do you know where he works? <laughs> was that, that was you guys! <laughs> they asked for a corporal walls and then a sergeant walls and if there was any walls there. And then when I said no, they said, get out, the roof's going to cave in. <laughs> oh, we're a bunch of bullies. <laughs> yeah, to me it does. Yeah, because I'm really gullible. So, yeah, all the time. One squadron has arrived at Bryce Norton in Oxfordshire. It's my first holiday, going to Afghanistan. It's been brilliant. <laughs> Children and his squadron are flying out on a TriStar, an old Pan Am passenger plane which the RAF bought in the 1970s. 
Today it's got some technical hitches, so there's a five hour delay. Now I'm sitting around in the departure line waiting for the aircraft. A lot of the younger guys are really apprehensive. A lot of the, you know, the lads that have been there before just like just want to get out there and get started. And wearing their dog tags for the first time makes their situation hit home, especially for 21-year-old Charles. And just to feel the coldness of it around your neck and just knowing what they mean. Because if I get them out for you, look, they got like your blood group, your name and like your religion. If you get captured or something, you just rip that off, give that to them. I get shot, hopefully not. But it's just the, it may not look much, but they mean so much. I feel like a proper soldier now. I just never want to take them off again now. Just want them on me. Well, this is me now for six, seven months. Just deal with it, get over it. This is the real deal now. It's not no training. You need to start switching on. Next stop, Kandahar Airfield, Afghanistan. At Kandahar Air Base in Afghanistan, Harrier pilot Bolly is bringing in his jet for some TLC. Hmm? What are you thinking? Uh, uh, the nose wheels sat quite high for some reason, so uh, I'm just trying to work out why. Engineers like Jumper Collins and his team are the unsung heroes of the war because without them, the planes won't fly. They're machines at the end of the day, every, every machine breaks down. With the aircraft vibrating and stuff like that, cracks appear, you know, things happen. I worked in a car garage for five years before I did this job and it's, uh, it's quite, quite a bit different. <laughs> the customers get a bit angrier if it isn't ready in time. Gave it a bit of a, a, bit of a bounce on landing, so well, not a bounce, but still. The engineers have eight Harriers to look after. If you lose an aircraft, go down to seven, there's a lot of pressure on you to get the aircraft up and running again, get back to eight. Um, the other day, I think we dipped down to six, and it was uh, quite hectic. So this is kind of like the, the service centre in a garage, I suppose. You've got different desks depending on what job's going on. So you've got an armourer's desk, they're dealing with the bombs and the ejection seats. You've got the, the fairies desk, which is, is uh, electricians, so they're dealing with all the wiggly amps inside the aeroplane. Um, and you've got the mechanical's desk, or the, the city's desk as we call it, because they're basically dealing with the engine and the airframe. Jumper's found a serious fault with Bolly's jet. Just here on the aircraft is where the fuel, forward fuel tank is, and we'd noticed fuel coming out down through that hole there. To get to the fuel leak, the engineers have got their work cut out. The Harrier's built around one central turbofan Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine. A nine and a half meter wing weighing two tons bolts on top. The leak is at the front of the fuel tank underneath the engine, and that means there's only one way to get to it. It's a wing off, engine out to find what's gone wrong. It's Tuesday today, we want to get it flying really by Friday. Tonight, Kate's got a date with her boyfriend. Obviously out here, you're not allowed actually to be together, really. It can be a bit difficult sometimes. And you're supposed to go easy on the makeup. At first, I was really aware of putting on maybe makeup or mascara or something to go to work. I thought, oh, would people think that I'm being a bit too girly? I'm not going to change what I like doing just because just because I'm out here, really. I, I like. We're just a big bunch of tarts, really, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> it's just nice to be a bit... Just keep a bit of normality about you, not completely go all military. Kate's meeting her boyfriend at the boardwalk. It's where you'll find a few familiar sights from home in the middle of the war zone. 
it's got fast food joints, a couple of supermarkets and even a bar. Only there's one thing missing, the alcohol. Because in Kandahar, it's strictly off limits. But the bar is one place where Ben and Kate can meet up. It can just get frustrating, that's all, because you can't really spend any proper time together. Well, basically, we're not allowed in the girls' block at all. I did try and go around his room, but we got kicked out. We like? both know what we're going to do. <laughs> have a cheeky little kiss and a cuddle, but uh, yeah, that's about as far as that goes. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> and there's another problem having a girlfriend here. I'm jealous. <laughs> All the blokes looking at her. <laughs> there's a lot of blokes out here. <laughs> Over on the runway, one squadron has just landed. At 2 a.m. in the 30 degree heat, they get their first look at Kandahar. They've been up for 24 hours. I don't actually feel like I'm here yet. It doesn't feel real at all. Can't wait to get sleep. I'm tired, absolutely knackered. Welcome to Kandahar. The local time here is 0220. But it's not time for bed yet. There's the induction to get through first. Most important, what to do in a rocket attack. You're to immediately lie face down on the ground. Further direction will be given by the movement staff. Some welcome speech. To unpack all your personal stuff, get it in there, get your nuts down, all right? But this is where it starts. Jonesy gives his boys a pep talk. All right, you need to fucking seriously switch on now. It gets fucking hectic from now on. And if I tell you to do something, make it up and last as quickly as possible. Help each other out. The regiment's used to roughing it in tents, so they're in for a nice surprise. This is the typical accommodation the lads will be staying in. Um, as you can see, it's, it is massively plush. Decent beds, decent lockers, you've got air conditioning. Um, you couldn't ask for more than this, basically. Bed at last, but not for Jonesy, and it's now 3 a.m. His keys are locked in his room. You got, you got yeah. All I'll do is go to bed. <laughs> With just three hours before they're on duty, this calls for lateral thinking. Might get to the window. Mate, I'll smash the window in a minute. All it needs is a little gentle persuasion. It is now. Seven minutes past four in the morning. That's the sort of thing that happens, so the first night here, it's bound to happen. Uh, everyone's laughing now, as you see, everyone's just getting the rest down, uh, which I'm about to do now. So, uh, we'll see you later on. <laughs> It's 5am, the coolest time of the day. There's not much traffic, so there's no dust. Too hot otherwise, too sweaty. <laughs> there's an eight mile jogging track around the camp and Kate keeps in shape by running three miles every morning. It's the only time you get here sat really. How do you? In work you're always with people. Obviously we share rooms. You just get a chance to think about things and think about home, and I just find it, I find it really relaxing. Over on the airstrip, Harrier engineer Jumper and his team are finishing off fixing the fuel leak on Bolly's jet. Yep. This is AT MacArthur. Trev, do you want to just give us a wave? He's up there reconnecting the uh, fuel supply. On the top there, we've got uh, number one, Dinger Bell. Dinger, say hello there. He's just connecting the back of the engines, the hot nozzles at the back. Rabbit, this is Rabbit. He's setting up the rigging of the nozzle so Dinger can connect the drive shaft. There's no yeah, room for yeah. error. Well, everything these guys put their name to, they're responsible for. So if anything did go wrong, they've signed it. <laughs> 
and it could be a matter of life or death for jet pilot Bolly, who's eager to get back up in the air. This jet's been out of the programme for three or four days. It, it, it's a jet that, that we can't fly. If push comes to shove and we need to, to, to launch you know, lots and lots of, of, of waves. So um, you know, these guys are working around the clock to get this jetty back ready to go in the air so that we can then fly it and go and support the guys on the ground. You know, we're saying, why is the jet not ready? Why is the jet not ready? Well, it's because it takes a lot of time like this job is now. Which Dinger has actually managed to do, so he's going to be pretty happy. Yeah. And it was that high. Yeah, just pissing into him. You just couldn't sit with the naked eye. I'll let you concentrate. You know, there's so many bits and pieces of the aeroplane that I really don't know what, what you know, what, what, what it does. And I, I can learn a bit by coming down here with the, the guys. So there's literally nothing I can do to help, is there? Right? Or is there? Is there any? Nope. Nope. The worst thing a pilot can do is come down and offer to help, but then completely cock it up. So um, <laughs> there's, there's lots of potentials for dropping screws down the engine, all, all sorts of things. So, um, you know, wherever I do come down, I've really got to try and make sure that I, I, I'm my best behaviour and I don't make any mistakes. But... Dinger and Rabbit tether the jet to the ground with chains so they can test the engine without it flying off. It's just really hot out here. I mean, it's about 37 degrees a day. This base plate, which we secure it onto, is boiling, been cooking in the sun all day, and now we're actually having to walk on it and work around it. And it's just really, really hot. Hopefully, um, well, it will pass its ground run first time. Before they start the engine, Dinger makes an important call. Sentries, are you in position? Over. We have to post sentries on the other side of this wall, right next to the minefield. Um, it's in case there's a lot of traffic run across this road over here and the stones get fired across at that higher velocity. It can take windows out, even hit people. The runway is also near an ammo dump, so it's not just vehicles that can be hit by stray stones. Roger that. There you go. That's it. Stand by for ground run. Right on. As the engine reaches full throttle, the chains have to withstand 22,000 pounds of thrust. So it's looking good, no leaks. Uh, all the figures seem to be matching up what they should be, so uh, it's all going well. But the real test is how it performs in the sky. Hoping it's going to work and everything's going to go all right. Should be fine. Done enough work on it, so it should be all right. If it is still leaking fuel, they'll have to strip the whole plane down and start again. Bob is planning to take the jet to 40,000 feet. We've done all our checks. It's past the flying colours on the ground run, so uh, there's no reason why it should, should have a problem out there. Get up there! But it's not taking off. Shit. Four days of work for nothing. Line message. Yeah, aircraft 43 is just uh, throttled up and throttled down on the runway. I think he's coming back in. But Jumper's just got the jitters. There's nothing wrong with the jet. Oh, he's just doing the slams over again, isn't he? Is he taxiing down to the end of the runway and then going to come back up the other way, is he? Yeah. OK, we'll do that. Volley goes for it. Come on, sir. Job done. Bolly's plane rejoins the squadron.
Kandahar airfield is guarded by the RAF regiment, and a new squadron has just arrived from the UK. This prefabricated town in the middle of the desert is going to be their home for the next seven months. Gentlemen, good afternoon. For those that don't know me, my name is Air Commodore Bob Judson. I am the base commander here. I wanted to get you all together really just to formally welcome you to Kandahar Airfield. You deliver a vital role towards keeping everybody that's inside it safe. We live in a war zone here and outside the wire, the moment you step outside it, you are in the threat zone. You know that as well as I do. So be safe, be careful, but obviously deliver the mission to the best you can. I think for the young guys, it's a really steep learning curve and it changes them irrevocably in some ways. And they go back wiser and different men for sure. First, a guided tour to help them get their bearings. If you look straight in front of you now, you're coming up to ECP3. That is your entry and exit to camp. So right outside, you've got the boardwalk, pizza rock, subway, Bird King burnt down a couple of months ago. And Poo Pond. The Poo Pond is the camp's biggest landmark, a sewage works the size of nine Olympic swimming pools designed for 3,000 people. Now it's struggling to cope with five times that number. You'll get used to that smell. You've got to turn the aircon off at night because it just sucks it all in. Anyone got any questions on a tour? We're about to we're on here now. Where are we? Fucking hell. That's a question. <laughs> it's overwhelming for new recruits like Nathan Chules. It's huge. Absolutely massive. Really busy as well. There's so many people around this camp. Loads of different nationalities. It just feels like I'm on like um, training exercise or something. But it's just really hot. <laughs> I've gone through like seven bottles of water already this morning. Just can't stop sweating. It's ridiculous. <laughs> And it's about to get a whole lot hotter with their heavy duty Osprey body armour. Who else is happy with the size of their Osprey? It's quite simple, it's either you're happy or you're not happy. Right, there you go. Do I keep All right. Yeah, that's yours. Which is the new type of body armour the lads wear when we go out on ops. With the Osprey, it must be the correct size. Because if you're involved in a blast, if it's not correct, um, it will cause you more damage than good. The lads know what particular size they need to hug their body. So they're going through, telling the storm exactly what size they uh, require, and then that will be issued, the correct size will be issued to that person. The body armour alone weighs 55 pounds, and once they've got all their kit on, it's like carrying an extra person on their back. Fit all your ammo pouches, your camel back, your water, it's a good bit of kit. But it is heavy. <laughs> And there's a last very important item, syringes, full of morphine. Well, the morphine is obviously if something does happen on the ground, uh, to stop the pain, the lads are trained to use that. Hopefully they won't need to use it, obviously. In the afternoon sun, Jonesy's boys get acclimatised to the heat. Right, stop there. Lads, if you put your knees down, you owe me a dollar. I don't expect anyone to put their fucking knees down. In 10 days, they'll be going outside the wire in full kit. Get your back straight. High fine time to train. You lot got twice as much time as me. No excuse, everyone understand that? After burning off all those calories, Chules and his mates decide to treat themselves to a Kandahar luxury. And it's all there on the boardwalk. When you come back and you get to have a pizza up, it's brilliant. Um, it's, 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 it's open till like two in the morning as well, isn't it? Yeah. Two in the morning. Yeah. American football over there. Ice hockey going on over there. I'm oh, not ice. Oh, ice. <laughs> I expect it to be like, just bog standard. But it's brilliant. It's like a summer camp. Kate's at the boardwalk too. She's just split up with her boyfriend, Ben. It's just such a different environment to be in that sometimes it works for people and sometimes it doesn't, and it hasn't for us. 
To cheer her up, the girls are taking her down the disco. It should be a good night, something different. Lots of meat. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to wear our body armour at the minute. It's not your average attire that you'd wear out. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> so it's a bit strange, but everyone wears it, so it's not that bad, really. Pain in the arm. The disco, run by the Dutch army, is one place where guns and knives aren't allowed. And you wouldn't want to mess with this bouncer. Like bees to honey, two US Marines make their move. How are you doing? I'm gone. What's your name? What is it? But there are a few language barriers. And kids. Kids? Yeah, kids. Oh. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Some nice men in there. <laughs> Can't help but look. Yeah, everyone's loaded in Wales. <laughs> we are. We were speaking to the US Marines, they're nice guys, friendly enough. A bit boring as Americans can be. <laughs> After a few non alcoholic beers, the night kicks off. Strange, you know, like having a drink and that, and people are like dancing, they're proper going nuts in there and they're sober. Next time on Warzone, Chules gets a reality check. Pretty nasty bit of kit, really, if you have to use them. You're in the shit, basically. <laughs> and Kate visits the fireman at Camp Bastion, <laughs> where she's in for a surprise. 